Coming up on today's edition of Locked On Eagles, I'm going to sit down with the first female scout in NFL history for the New York Jets, Connie Carberg. We're going to go over how women are increasing their role in the NFL, how things have changed from the 1970s to now in the NFL draft process, prospect evaluation, philosophies, mock drafts. It's all coming up next in a loaded conversation with Connie Carberg right here on Locked On Eagles. You are Locked On Eagles, your daily Philadelphia Eagles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Eagles your first listen each and every day. I am your host of your daily Philadelphia Eagles podcast, Louis DiBiase. This is Locked On Eagles. It is a Wednesday edition of the show. Guys, today's podcast is episode three of five. We have five a week, Monday through Friday, posted on all of our podcast platforms. Wherever you get the show, we are available. We're also available in video form as well on YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, not only for full podcasts and video form, but we're also doing YouTube exclusive content only for our page. So, so that is all available for you. And we're also on Twitter at LockdownBirds, at DBLCLOE, and at GC20. 24 underscore football. As I mentioned in the open, so excited about today's guest on the show. I had the pleasure of meeting her down in Mobile, Alabama. I'm on the sidelines uh, before the game on Saturday afternoon. And what I love about the Senior Bowl, it's not only important for teams as part of this draft process, it's not only important for prospects, but it was really great going down there just like from a, a fan, a media, a human perspective to meet all these amazing people that, you know, share in your love and passion for football to where they're just evaluating every single player and they just football just runs in their blood. And I got to meet so many incredible Eagles fans, listeners of the show, you know, different Eagles media members, my boys from Fourth and John, Chris Malley and Gail Saunders, got to hang out with them all week. And then I also met before the game, I started talking to this woman and come to find out we were just, you know, spitballing about the prospects, Jermaine Johnson, how great these edge rushers looked, Malik Willis. Come to find out she was the first female scout in NFL history, Connie Carberg. She was with the New York Jets from 1975 to 1980. And I thought, I have to have this woman on the show. She's just so knowledgeable and passionate about football. And she is a pioneer for females in sports. Again, the first female scout in NFL history coming from somebody that already had my difficulties of not even getting into the NFL like for teams, but just getting into media is a very difficult path to have a career in sports. Imagine being a female in the 1970s in doing it and then getting to select potential you know, future NFL legends as Connie did. She had an amazing track record. And so I wanted to pick her brain today about you know the obstacles she had to overcome, the female movement right now in the NFL and in sports and the awesome progress we're seeing. But not just that, but also just like how the draft process has changed with the technological advancements and the, um, you know, improvement of, you know, data, advanced analytics and social media. It's easier, I think, to find prospects. I want to kind of go into the differing strategies, maybe from now to then, how things differ, you know, um, best player available versus need philosophy on that. There's just so much I wanted to talk with her about. And I didn't have time on that Saturday in Alabama because the game started. So I asked her to come on the show. She found some time for me today. It's an awesome 30 minute conversation. I hope you guys really enjoy it. I'm going to dive into it now. This is Locked on Eagles, Connie Carberg, the first female NFL scout joining me on today's show. Let's get into that conversation. All right, Eagles fans, welcome back in to another edition of Locked On Eagles. I'm your host, Louis DiBiase. Really honored to be joined by my next guest on the show. She became the first NFL scout, a female NFL scout in NFL history back in the 1970s with the New York Jets. I had the honor to meet her down in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. It's Connie Carberg. Uh, Connie, thank you so much for joining the show today. I'm really excited to talk to you. Well, thank you, Louis. It was a pleasure to meet you down there. And um, 
I'm honored to be on and hello uh, Eagle fans. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I think this is just a great conversation. You know, I think Eagles fans and NFL fans alike are so fascinated now with the NFL draft process and they really have got, it's gotten more and more popular, you know, throughout the years. So I thought this conversation, especially with the combine coming up next week would be a uh, really good timing. And, you know, from somebody that, you know, went through it as a former scout, I'm always interested to hear, you know, people, how they got their start in this business through media, you know, players, scouts, front office members, because it's such a unique field that it doesn't really have a step-by-step -step process like some other careers do. You know, you go to school for something, you do an internship and boom, a full-time job. But with football and sports, it's kind of different. And I'm just really fascinated to hear from you, like how, how, what got you started and interested in becoming a scout and how did that all come to be with the Jets? Well, go, you're going to go way back before probably even a lot of uh, your listeners were born. Yeah. And, and it was way back in um, in the 1960s. And my father and my uncle became the two team doctors for the New York Titans, who then yeah. became the New York Jets. Oh. And I played a lot of sports and everything, but I, football, there was nothing um, as far as women were concerned. And there was no such thing as flag football. There was just mm -hmm. nothing. You know, we played basketball and we played softball and volleyball and all the rest of the things. So I figured though, I better learn it a little bit. Well, I started it. I had um, an earth science teacher I had who was uh, went to the games with us and I'd stay after school and he would explain a lot. He was a football coach as well. And then uh, Walt Michaels, who coached in Philadelphia for about three years. Yeah. He was defensive coordinator for the Eagles. And he then was with the, but he was with the Jets in the 60s as a defensive coordinator. In fact, when they won the Super Bowl, yeah. he was a defensive coordinator. At that time, you, you had a head coach. You mm -hmm. had two assistants on offense, two assistants on defense. And now what? I was counting up the other day. There's like 24 coaches. On That's these a lot. Teams. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to four. So it was very different back then, lots of differences. And so I just started learning more and more about the game. Then I went, well, the Jets won the Super Bowl in my senior year of high school, which was like the epitome. You know, the one mm -hmm. Super Bowl that we won. Oh, yeah. But it's funny, even before that, they didn't, of course, you have no, you had no ESPN, you had nothing. All you had was Street and Smith, the magazine. Yeah. And you had a one game on during the week. And that was about it. And but I started making my own mock drafts when I was 16. I don't know why um, or how or you know what made me do that kind of thing because there were, certainly weren't any scouts and uh, it wasn't something that I really knew a lot about. But I just said, oh, I want this player. I like the way he plays. Like Ron Yari, I picked in my first round, who turned out great, and then Garrett Ford turned out lousy in the second round. And so I was, you know, just trying. I always tell people that's about right for uh, NFL drafts if you can hit mm -hmm. on people you're doing really well. So. Um, I did that, and then I went to an all-girls college, transferred then to Ohio State, which was my smart move, and met Woody Hayes, who was great to me. Uh, I went up to him, and he was. We met over um, after we met at the union. And I, I brought my his book with me. You win with people. Yeah. Then um, he met with me, and we talked. At this time, there was nothing for women. There was nothing. There was no pre games. There was nothing. But he said, "You know, you love football so much. I want you to come to all the practices." Talk to scouts when they come. You're welcome, whether it's open or closed. And he was another great male mentor besides Walt Michaels that I learned a lot from. So I was very blessed in having that. So, you know, it just kept growing and growing. Yeah. Then, and I thought I was going to uh, teach at Babylon High School where I went. And then I would teach and then I would coach girls sports. Because remember now, at this time, um, there were no, uh, when I went to school, there were no scholarships. Title IX mm -hmm. had just passed about a year before I graduated. In 74, I graduated. And uh, so it was very, very different back then. So I, after I did that, I kept learning more and more. And then my, my dad had a 50th birthday party. And the I sat down with Charlie Winner, who was the head coach, and I started talking to him. And he said, you really love football. We're building a brand new complex out here at Hofstra University on Long Island. They just had practice there, but they didn't have their own building at that time. He said, I'd like you, would you consider working? I said, are you kidding me? He said, I can tell you have a passion and <laughs> that you love the game. So I did. And that's how I started working for them in 19, uh, August of 1974. And I was the only woman in the entire building, just me. Wow. And uh, the coaches, the players, the training staff, the, the business office was on Park Avenue in New York. Mm -hmm. But out on, at, we were where the players were. Yeah. And it was very relaxed, loose. It was a whole different world. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. And, you know, especially at the time, you know, what were some obstacles you had to overcome? As you said, you were the only female at the time. Did you start as a scout with the Jets or did you have to work your way up? Obviously, you talked about so many different things you had to learn and continue to grow your knowledge, you know, in such a, a complicated sport. But I think especially for a female in the 1970s, you know, what were some of the obstacles you had to overcome at that time to move up? It's already hard, as I mentioned, to move up in the NFL business and, you know, especially at that time for a female. Yeah, it was really unheard of. Phyllis George hadn't yeah. even started on the pregame show. But as I said, so I just, I, I kept learning. And um, Mike Holovac became my boss as a director of player personnel. Back in those days, your director of player personnel actually did a lot of selecting as well as your general manager, probably even more so. Yeah. So he, I learned so much from him. And I was a receptionist in the front desk, um, which so I got to know everybody in the NFL that came in. And Joe Namath was still with the team. Mm -hmm. So everybody wanted to meet Joe. If they, if they were performing at Westbury Music Fair or something, that everybody came. Uh, Pele came. You name it. Um, Lou Ferrigno, the Incredible Hulk, he <laughs> came in. I mean, you can't imagine Roy Rogers. Just so many different people were all wanted to meet Joe. So they'd be coming in. Great way to, I loved every minute. Of that. But I was also uh, doing scouting secretarial work, you know, when with the, um, the Jets had their scouts and they had yeah. a national combine. So between those two things, all the reports would go into books. I had to arrange where they were, blah, 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 all that stuff. And it was really good. And then 1970, so I was doing that. But the only thing is one of my biggest obstacles was mm -hmm. I didn't know how to be a secretary. I had no idea. I didn't take typing. In those days, you either went to secretarial school or you went to college. And, if, and so I could just, you know, kind of peck around on the thing on the typewriter and you had white out. But... Just say that when the general manager says to me, oh, I need you to write a letter to another general manager. I didn't know the form. Mm -hmm. And there's no YouTube. And there's no right. Google. Yeah. There's no computers. There's no cell phones. I can mm -hmm. go through the whole and there was nothing. So you had your typewriter and you had a and a regular, regular old phone. So it was really, so that was my biggest thing. But I was very blessed that the Jets didn't hire me how many words per minute I could type. They were more about attitude. Yeah. And we saw that my passion for the game. So then all of a sudden, my boss, Mike Holbeck, in 1970, the draft was 17 rounds back then. After 75, it went to 12 rounds, and now yep. we have seven rounds. But back then, you had 17, and there was no such thing as free agency. So when you when you got a player, he was yours for life, unless you, you know, had a special trade or something, you know, kind of thing. But once mm -hmm. you drafted him, um, you, you know, you, you he was yours. It was like, you're, you know, just part of your family always. And you didn't worry about the next big contract or what was going to happen. Or if you had to take four years to develop a quarterback, it was fine. You know, it was very, it was a whole different sure. world, as I said. Yeah. So um, the, the 75 draft were 17 rounds. And when they got to the last round, Al Ward, who was a general manager, and Mike Hollaback said to me, we want you to make the last pick. So I made the last pick, the only female to do that. After that was over, and then I started doing just more things, uh, anything that they asked me to do as far as football is concerned and learning. And I, Mike Holovac was teaching me a lot. His two drafts, I know it was way back, but if you look at 76 and 77, mm -hmm. in those drafts, they were like the basis of the team that went to the AFC championship game with against in 82. Yep. Because of, uh, but Don Shula didn't put the tarp down. So, but we had a very fast team. But in those drafts, we picked up Marvin Powell, who's an all pro tackle, Wesley Walker, Joe Klecko. Abdul Salam, so we picked up half of the, in those two, half of the um, a sack exchange. Yeah. We picked up Richard Todd, and we have Greg Buttle, and Dan Alexander, just, I can't tell you how many players, Kevin Long, Scotty Durkin, it was amazing, those, in those two. And then we picked up some more guys in 78, you know, in 79, and pretty soon that team was really coming together. So that's what I did, and about a year later, um at the al ward we were having we were doing the game plan back in the locker room you'd, you'd all sit around eating chinese food at night mm -hmm. and you, uh we'd be working on this uh, game plan and al ward and mike halifax said we want you to do some we want you to do some scouting for us kind of we want you to do, we want you to do some, but they didn't say like you're going to be the first female scout or right right was, it was just you're going to go you're going to do scouting you've proven to us you know some stuff yeah i said great okay and that from there I proceeded, I went to Ohio State where I, of course, had carte blanche with Woody Hayes and I went to the Orange Bowl, Boston College, wrote reports, uh, graded films. And in those days you had reel to reel, mm -hmm. not tapes and everything. And they was, it was a lot different. So I, I would write my reports just like the other scouts. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think you knew you talked about being a receptionist and, you know, the Eagles general manager, Howie Roseman had a, a different path too. like he never played the game of football. And, you know, I remember he talked about starting up his NFL career and how he would, you know, send letters to every team and, you know, just try to take every opportunity he could get, even if it, you know, being a receptionist or for in radio too. I remember growing up too in this career, you got to take a lot of opportunities you can get. And I think passion you mentioned and patience are two of the most important keys. And, you know, for you, you know, taking that step from from being a receptionist to then proving, you know, making a selection that year, then becoming a scout with the Jets the next year. I think, you know, back then and even to this day, not just with females, but, you know, with men also that did not play the game of football. I don't know. Do you think there is maybe sometimes a narrative, maybe a false narrative about, you know, the individual's ability to evaluate the game prospects from a perspective of somebody who didn't play the game? I, I don't know. I feel like that's something still to this day that, I don't know if there's a stigma about it, but what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I do feel that it sure helps if you play the game. No yeah, question in my absolutely. mind. It's a big help. And the fact that there is flag football now, you know, as well mm -hmm. as the real tackle, you know, kind of thing for women. And they they do have that opportunity, whereas it wasn't available. Right. So I, what I had to do is, you know, I, I think it's definitely an advantage. you got to be honest in this world. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it is an advantage if you play the game. Of course. And, but... I would say that would help more for coaching. Scouting, as I said, um, I learned like what they were trying to look for. Now, and it's not an, uh, an exact science, inexact, right? So you see first round draft picks, you look three years later, half of them are not there or they've right. been traded or something like that. So I figure I could get it just as wrong as any guy could. Cause I mean, I, I, and, but you know, you have to kind of try writing things and then see if you maybe have an aptitude for it. And back then I do have to say though, back then it was different. You everybody played the four three. You didn't have situational players. Sure. If a guy was a tweener, right? If he wasn't quite like now, they take safeties, make them into linebackers. Blah, blah. Yeah. Back Great then, point. they they weren't there. You had your linebackers were two forty. They were plugging holes. They were in the four three. That's what they were there for. Not pass coverage. We didn't. Mm -hmm. That was the thing they were doing back then. And your safeties and your corners. So everything was kind of set and quarterback, all that type of thing. So it was a little bit easier. Now there is so much and so much change. Even, even in drafting quarterbacks, we're looking completely different. So as I said, I really do believe it does help. Yeah. I can't say that, but I, um, and there are those opportunities now, but I still think, as I said, you have, if you find out that you have that aptitude after you try it, maybe in college or, or scouting high school players, see what you do. And if you think that you have that knack or feel, um, and know what, and hopefully been taught by a lot of, uh, I said, I had a lot of great male mentors. And absolutely. And I think too, nowadays too, with social media, with advanced analytics, you know, there's so much film access, even for non-teams, oh. but media and fans too. I think it's easier for non-former players to gain knowledge in this sport for sure. Um, yeah. You know, from your perspective, you know, you mentioned how back then like prospects were different, you know, a, a safety that could play corner and linebacker right now in the NFL teams prioritize the Swiss army knife, if you will, so much where back then it was different. Yes. Um, what, what do you notice, too, about the difference in the evaluation process nowadays because of technology and social media? Was, I don't know, was there a time where prospects would maybe go under the radar because they were just missed because of it was hard to find everybody? You know, how different is it from then to now when it comes to that process? Yeah, I mean, you had scouts and you were hitting most of the places, but there were, yeah. and then they would end up having sometimes some free agent tryouts, you know, kind of like a combine, not a combine, but just people coming in and they would sign right. them much more loose. And people like with Walt Michaels, it was funny, by Bruce Harper, one of our best running backs that we had back then, mm -hmm. a, a fire, fireman Ed wears the 42 for Bruce Harper. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, but Bruce, what Walt Michaels' son happened to go to school with him at, in a small college, right? Kutztown State. Mm -hmm. And nobody really saw, had gone there and, and seen him. And he said, Dad, I, I, there's a player here that I think you should look at. And so he came over, we signed him, and he was, uh, you know, a, a great player for many years for the Jets. So I think that now you, you couldn't Google like now or YouTube. Now you can go every night I can go on YouTube here and say, okay, just, uh, you know, in the micro, say, who do I want to watch today? Well, you couldn't do that back then. You were lucky if you had even a one tape. And if you had one, you had to look at it, send it on to another team. Um, as I said, it was, yeah, it was, it was very, very different back then. And now... Um, as they have, you know, the Jets were the first ones to do like a similar to the combine. Yeah. In, in 1979, 80, they brought 100 players to Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, where my uncle worked. And 
they brought the players in and we would, you know, grade them physically on whether or not we would draft them or not. A lot of guys got rejected. A lot of them didn't. And then from there, you would do, I would interview them and talk to them. Some, some players don't want to play in a big city like Philadelphia or New York. They mm -hmm. feel much more comfortable in a small place or whatever, or the kind of person that they are. And so that was, those things started becoming bigger and bigger. Also, even to this day, you know, some teams, and back then too, some teams value character and right. players, and some people want kind of like a, a wild stallion out there. You're kind of a guy that's going to just go all out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you you know, maybe he not, not causes trouble, but he's just a little bit looser that way. Right. So each team has their own way of, um, of judging. And there's no right or wrong. You've got to just do what works for your particular team. Absolutely. What too, you know, we met at the senior bowl and I think that's still a very important part of the draft process nowadays, you know, being up close and personal with these players, both on and off the field. I think the combine the pro days are like that as well, but you know, we, we talked about how, you know, there was different, you know, technology and different access to these prospects for teams, media fans alike back then, how important were things like the senior bowl and, you know, those kind of combines and workouts to get those players up close and personal. So, you know, they didn't kind of get lost lost on your draft board. I know you drafted, you know, uh, Mark uh, Gostino in the second round. And, you know, he was projected at one point, I think I read to be a eighth round draft pick. And that was a home run decision over a hundred career sacks. And I believe you found him at the senior bowl, correct? Yeah, I didn't find him there. What I did was we had a, uh, we were coaching the senior bowl. This, that's why this was so exciting because it was yeah. 43 years since the last time the Jets actually coached a senior bowl. Senior yeah. bowl has always been important. Hula yeah. Bowl, Senior Bowl, East West Shrine. There was even a Japan Bowl, and so those were very big. Mm -hmm. So, I, as I said, when when um, they needed a, a replacement for Mike Stenzer, who got hurt, and my boss was on the road, he said, "I need you to find the person that will fill in." That time, Mark was probably Gaston. I was probably between four and uh, four and seven or eight in that you know because most of your first and second round picks like uh, like Fred Smurlis and Marty Lyons, they already were at the Senior Bowl. So yeah. I had to find somebody. Most of the guys, and you know, as I said, this remember, you didn't have all the stuff you have now, and you have to find these guys to begin with. Right. You know, there's no cell phones and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I looked all around, um, judged on whatever I could do. But one guy was faster, but he was from a very small school. And the other four, I narrowed it down to five people. And so I called each one. And that's like the interview part. And when I called, most of them were like, okay, you know, I'll go to the senior bowl. That sounds good. Ba ba ba. One person was, get me on the next plane. That's all I want. All my, my whole life is football. I can't wait. I'm ready. So I, I'm a person that likes passion. It likes excitement. It likes yeah. a, a guy that goes all out. And that kind of sold me. So I, got, I went back and looked to see who it was. And that was Mark Gastineau, who became the sack leader until Sprayhand kind of broke it. Yep. When it was Brett Favre thing. So, but for 15 years, 18 years, that stood. And I didn't know he was going to be as great as he was, but I just saw he had four five five speed at six four and two seventy. Right. So he uh, that and he went down there and he just you know you know how uh, Jermaine Johnson they said tore everything up right. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the kid in the even the kid from UConn. I mean, we can name some kids that were really great at the Senior Bowl this year. Mm -hmm. and they really upped up their value. And yeah. So Marty Lyons became our first draft pick that year, and I, I was the one that always called it in, and then. Then Mark became our second second pick, and they were the other half of a, the, the famous sack exchange. That, yeah, that had, you know, sixty six sacks in one season. Yeah. And then with Mark Asano, too, I wanted to ask you about that, you know, early projection and then you guys taking him in the second round and it, it being an incredible pick. You know, how important is it staying true to your board? I think sometimes in the NFL, I don't know if teams do it more, but there's this group think a lot of the time where there's the same thought on a prospect. And sometimes because of that, you know, a player, you know, falls down into the draft and then you're wondering years later, how did he fall that far? You know, how true, how important is it to, you know, not fall into that trap of group think, you know, stay true to your draft board and just trust your eye there. You know, we talked about how much data there is now to evaluate these players, but how true is it too sometimes to just go off of your own evaluation, your eyes, your own philosophy compared to, you know, what everyone else is telling you and what all the numbers tell you? I mean, is there still value in that? Yeah, there is. And Louie, you're, you're so right. The hardest thing is to say, you know, when everybody's gathering at these bowl, at, at the senior bowl, and yeah. you see everybody is networking and talking and mm -hmm. discussing. And then you say, oh, you know what? I think of this person. And so then a bunch, even, you know, even from other teams, then you go back to your group and you sit there and you have to say what your thoughts are. And it is, it's, it's hard. 
to, especially if it's somebody that other people think should be a third rounder and you think they should be right. a first rounder. You know, it's not, it's not bad if you, if one, if somebody thinks somebody should be a 10th pick and somebody thinks they should be a 14th pick, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But if there's a big discrepancy or you yourself say, uh-uh, you know, I heard about this guy or yeah, this guy has got a great work ethic, blah, blah, blah. Whatever you find out as a scout, that's where great scouts come in too. Yeah. They find out that extra uh, about the kid. Absolutely. And I want to ask you too about that. What is that process like in a war room, you know, when there is an NFL draft going on and, you know, there's a lot of scouts for a team. It's not just, you know, you mentioned how there isn't just four coaches anymore. There is a lot of people with different opinions in just one team, you know, with front office members, coaches, scouts, and you have a player you might want to, you know, quote unquote, pound the table for and try to get him selected. What, you know, was there a process with that? I mean, was that a difficult thing to, you know, somebody you were really passionate about taking that player, getting that player selected for your team with so many, you know, different minds and uh, thoughts in that room? Well, I think it is. It's very, that's why you don't want to have a zillion people in there. Like mm-hmm. when we, and things have changed. So I, you know, I see the war rooms now and how, how they look and ours were basically, we didn't have the coaches in. It was just the, just the, uh, the scouting department and the doctors and, you know, and the general manager. And that was it. And then I was one calling it, but most of the work had been done beforehand. Okay, so you have everything lined up, even right. though we did it manually back then, the height, weight, speed, the, your Wonderlick score, whether it was on AstroTurf or grass, because you're a lot faster on AstroTurf. If you run four or six on AstroTurf, yeah, that's not that great, but it's not that bad on grass, depending on your position, right? So we had, a, we had all that information, and then you have to, you know, most of it is done beforehand. That's why they have all these meetings. Scouting is a tough thing. They're on the road or they're having meetings back there. So you have to really love what you do. Yeah. Doing a lot of travel but it is it's um it's it's a whole there's there's, there's so much to it. i say i i'm not in the draft room now so i can't say what it's like now you know or mm-hmm. what's on tv we didn't have espn even so we just you know we had our bagels and we had stuff and it went all the way through it wasn't on tv so we started it was 17 rounds on a day and you went all the way through till about midnight then the next day you finished it all up the 17 rounds and it wasn't on tv so it wasn't a big show and um, part of the time that I was there, you know, they had the other league come up. Um, you know, it's interesting when you were asking about, too, about players and picking players. Yeah. The Back in the beginning, it was very interesting because the AFL was the upstart league. You know how you – every time. And the NFL was the established one. The AFL, if you look like the Jets Super Bowl team, they had five players from HBCU. They were very, they were very big into HBCU – very much so. The Kansas City Chiefs had, you know, Buck Buchanan and uh, so many different people. There were, the Raiders had guys, and they said the Jets had Verlin Biggs and Emerson Boozer and Winston Hill. Um, and a lot of people. So I think that's where the AFL, when you were saying did, did some people slipped through the cracks, I think it was really yeah. big. Back then the Jets, the AFL went very big into the HBCU and tapped a uh, source that hadn't really been tapped. And these guys were awesome. I want to ask you too, you mentioned earlier, and we're kind of now like zooming in more on the draft process inside the war room and for these teams and what you guys went through to, you know, set that board and get your guy up there. And then when it comes time to make the selections, I I, I think you mentioned too, something really important, I think is, you know, having that cohesive unit and everybody being on the same page. Um, you know, part of that process too, you mentioned when you were 16 doing mock drafts. And I think, you know, a lot of, that's a very popular thing with media and fans. I've been doing it since I was 10 years old, but is that something too, is that something too, that is part of the process for NFL teams to prepare themselves for, you know, how different scenarios could play out different strategies. Like, let's say if we went corner here, you know, how would the board fall with this position based on need and best player available? You know, exactly. it is so complicated. Is Are mock drafts important for teams as well? Back then, yeah, they didn't do per se mock, but they had the board set up. Okay, here's our list of – and most times you took the best player available. Sometimes yeah. you went position. But most times they went – you know, best player that they uh, they had lined up or, but but if they thought there was really a, a huge need, then they would go for yeah. that. But that's that's how it worked there. But as far as doing, I don't I don't remember sitting around, you know, doing mock drafts. We just talk, we, we talked a lot about the players right. and what you might, what they might be like. But as I said, there were no pro days and there was no combine. So, you know, and there was nothing on TV. So after the, after all the bowl games were over, 
it's kind of like, okay, we're going to meet and just do our own little thing mm -hmm. with our own scouts. Plus every team uh, had like Blesto, United, National, where they shared scouts. And so you, you would do that kind of thing. So it was, as, as yeah. I said, it was very, a very different um, way of doing it. But you still you had to, like you said, stick to your guns, decide who you wanted. Um, some teams uh, let their scouts do the middle rounds. Some teams let them do all the rounds with the head guys. And, and some want the coaches' inputs, the assistant coaches, like I heard, you know, the Jets do. Yeah. Um, but every, every back then, it was every team was different. Yeah, and I think too. I think it's interesting you mentioned like best player available versus need. This is something we debate a lot on this show over the last few years. But like, what what are your thoughts on this? Because as you mentioned, you know, you want to take the best player available on the board, but is there a balancing act you need to find? Because for instance, like, let's say you had four cornerbacks that are under the age of 26 and they're all showing promise heading into year two or three, you know, maybe you have a corner at the top of your board, but maybe two spots down, you have a you know, defensive end and you really need pass rush help. Is there a balancing act? Maybe it's not as black and white as we're only going to take the best player available. Or we're only going to take the the biggest need. Is there a lot to it? You know, you can mention even the depth of the prospect pool. Like if there's only really a few good receivers we like on day one or day two, you know, and he's a two spots below a, a, an offensive tackle, we mm -hmm. might want to take him. Like, I just feel like yeah. maybe it's more complicated than that. And no, it's very much like what you said, the, the way they do it with their best player available. Um, as I said, you really want to go with the best one, unless there, and if you can. Yeah. Um, if there's a huge drop off, that's when you're a best player. Right. If it's so close, then you got to you got to go. You know, with with need, very definitely. And as I said, every but again, every team is different, mm -hmm. and and time times have changed. Now, if you look back, just like running backs aren't valued the way they used to be compared, sure. which I really feel badly about because they're so important, to, as we know, to to, mm -hmm. to winning, but. Back, I did a little study on myself uh, for every 10 years, like from the uh, 60s to the 70s, you know, 70 to 85, then 85 to, 90, to 2000. And, then, and what happened was in the in the early years from the 60s, 70s, the it was 25 running backs to eight quarterbacks that were taken in the first 10 picks. Hmm. Okay, it's there. Now you go to now, it's completely the opposite. It would be, it was five running backs in the top 10 picks over 10 years and 28 Quarterback. So now we are now a quarterback league, right. of a, a passing league. So again, that changes everything too. So you know we're, we're now this philosophy is you can get a runner. Well, back in the old days when you had you know Earl Campbell and Tony Dorsett yeah. and Smith, running backs were like the thing. They were the quarterbacks. Yeah, I think I think position. Would you agree? Position value is something that's a part of that you know process too. Yeah. Yeah, well, very much so. They, you know, because because of um, the monetary slotment that they slots that they have now. Yeah. You know, in the old days, before you played, you got paid, especially if you were the first round pick, an exorbitant bonus and everything else. So then they had the CBA in 2011 changed everything. Now it's that second contract that's so big, and mm -hmm. the, the other ones are just slotting in, so people aren't holding out anymore. But as a result, you you rush everybody to to play. You have to. You don't have yeah. A anymore. yeah, it's definitely different in that way. Uh, let me ask you too, a few more questions for you. Do you have any specific philosophies like for you when it comes to the prospects that you really liked or you weren't a big fan of when it comes to your talent evaluation process? Were there any like really important parts of your philosophy that you were very disciplined in certain traits you prioritize maybe on the field or off the field that were if you found a few things, that's what you really value maybe more than anything else? I think production, you know, if they didn't produce in college, yeah. that kind of thing, um, I'm, I'm big on that. Also, you know, the, the work ethic, the love of the game, the attitude, because yes. the, the height, weight, and speed, you know, football, it's not just height, weight, and speed. It's, you know, you can't, that's why 40% of the league are, are undrafted mm -hmm. because there's something else in them that makes them able to play, whether it's their heart, whether it's their work ethic, whether it's the love of the game, whatever it may be, their passion. And that's where I would, I always tend to go for that type of player that I see that is on every down. I see him going all out. I don't have to question it. Um, you know, like I, I did with Vernon Golston. I, you know, I, 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 I like, I keep watching Kayvon. I know he's got all the ability in the world, but I want to see it on every down. Yeah. Like, like you do on Jermaine Johnson, you know? Don't tell my co-host he's an Oregon fan. <laughs> well, I wanted to see, you, can, you know, and, but again, and, and different people respond differently some players are better in the pros than they are in college 
Mm -hmm. Just because of also the scheme of teams now. In the old days, again, it wasn't uh, the scheme wasn't everybody played basically the same. Right. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't have spread offenses. You didn't have RPOs. Defense was allowed to hit. You, you could take a guy's head off coming over the middle, boy, you know, Atwater and Ronnie Lott and all John Lynch. Nobody, you know, who had the guts to go over the middle? You could hit the receivers all the way down the field until the ball was thrown. Uh, you know, it, it was a very different game than it is now. In some ways, I like it. In some ways, I don't. Absolutely. Uh, one more question for you, Connie. You know, uh, you became the first female scout in NFL history. How does it make you feel to see some females really starting to make more progress in the NFL today? I mean, there's still a long way to go, but, you know, the Eagles assistant general manager, Catherine Race, she actually interviewed with the Minnesota Vikings this year uh, for their open general manager position. She was the first female to ever interview for a GM spot. You know, does it see us as a pioneer for women in sports? Like, that's got to make you feel good, I'm sure, to see that progress. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. As I said, mine was back. I didn't know it was a big deal because mm -hmm. they just didn't make it a big deal. Luckily, a few reporters, and when I went out to Ohio State, they wrote an article because it wasn't like, okay. We're, so then about, other than Ralph Wilson's daughter, who was the owner of the Buffalo Bills, she did some yep. stuff in the 80s. But then it took like, you know, almost 40 years. And then you have really Bruce Arians opened the door for everybody with Jen Welter. And then you had the Jets had three um, – scouting one of them was Callie Bronson she was a scouting intern and now she, here she is chief of staff so I know I think it's great what I think is going to be really good is when it's not automatic to that right away women automatic you know I, when you look at a guy when you look at coach Sal he's had 20 years of trying to of, of working his way before he right. gets the coach most of them have at least six to some of them have like Bruce Arians probably 40 years before they became a head coach sure as I said, right now it's the novelty and 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 trying to make sure that women get ahead. So they're we're putting everything in fast. But I think as time goes on, it becomes more the norm. You'll see more women in the college ranks and then working their way up. Absolutely. Same way the guys do, because I think that's only fair. Um, you know, versus just saying, okay, you know, you had a year being an intern and doing one other year here, and you're ready now to you know go be a coach. Yeah, and I think you will see it increase more, too, with, you know, again, when you don't play the game, I think it's harder to find shortcuts. If, if you're a retired potential Hall of Fame receiver, you could become a head coach in just a couple years, right? And so I feel like right when you don't play the game, it's, you know, it takes, it's a step-by-step -step process. But I, I do think, Connie, that's the one really nice thing about the more data we have now and just different access to the process and the evaluation is that, again, we kind of going back to playing versus not playing, you mentioned the value of a coach or a scout that used to play, but I think that's a good avenue too that's helping, you know, not just females, but all non-former players, you know, kind of make their way into this business. I think so too. And then all these, <clears throat> they never had anything like internships or, you know, right. in sport. and now people have it, all these young people have a chance. And I speak to a lot of them at a lot of different schools and stuff, you know, and they have a chance to go in, whether it's in operations or whether it's in scouting or coaching yeah. or, or PR or trainers or anything, but they have a chance to go in, see what it's like, um, maybe that is for them, maybe it isn't. And, or somebody else in another department says, oh, I like the way that person works. I, I always tell them it only takes one person to believe in you. Mm -hmm. And then you, you can go from there. So I think, as I said, I think internships are another another great way. That, so they're around the game even more. Um, yeah. So the more you're around the game, and I have to say, you know, guys have been really amazing though. I, even when I go down to the senior bowl, wherever I am, and I just see how they are, you know, helping, um, being right in it, you know, with women and men together, the whole thing, and with not not even being a big deal. It, they're yeah. working together. And I just think it's awesome. I'm, uh, you know, being an older person, and not that's something, you know, it's it's just uh, mind boggling sometimes. But I yeah. think it's, I think it's really awesome. I agree. I definitely agree. And that's why it's great to cover a team like the Eagles that, you know, have a female high in the front office and, you know, really helping. She was down at the senior bowl too. And, you know, they have a great track record over the last few years, especially late in the draft. So um, thank you so much, Connie, for coming on the show. Former NFL scout Connie Carberg joining Locked On Eagles, the first female scout in NFL history for the New York Jets. A lot of awesome stuff. And uh, we really do appreciate you coming on the show today. You guys have a great fight song, I have to say. <laughs> Absolutely. I love my J-E-T-S, just, just, just. But I do have to say, the, you know, the Eagle fight song is, is awesome. And the Giants are my enemy, so I always root for you to beat the Giants. Appreciate it. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> Thank you so much to Connie Carberg, formerly of the New York Jets, the first female 
NFL scout in the history of football joining us on today's edition of Locked on Eagles. Guys, really hope you enjoyed this conversation. Going to try to have some more guests like Connie coming up throughout the offseason through the free agency process, through the draft process as well. I thought she had an amazing story, some awesome perspective on so many different NFL topics. And she just, again, continued to you know, and it confirmed this belief I have of how complicated things are with the NFL draft and just roster building there. As she mentioned, there is no set way to go about things. Each Super Bowl champion is different. The Los Angeles Rams this year, I mean, they built a super team of older veterans through trades and the Eagles kind of took a similar approach and the Cincinnati Bengals made it, you know, building through the draft. And that really hasn't changed. A lot has changed as she mentioned, but uh, one thing does remain the same that the NFL is a mystery. There's a lot of different processes, philosophies, strategies, and, you know, it just comes down to conviction and, you know, passion, I think is something she really talked about too, that helps. And, uh, it's hard to be consistent in this league. And that's just one part, one example of why it's harder to win in football consistently compared to basketball and even baseball and hockey. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful, complicated sport. And we appreciate Connie coming on the show today. We'll be back for Lockdown QB1 tomorrow with Gino Camilleri and myself. Again, subscribe to Lockdown Eagles wherever you get the podcast. We're available five days a week on all platforms in video form as well on YouTube. And we're on Twitter at Lockdown Birds and at DBossi LOE. Thank you for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen each and every day. I'm Louis DiBiase signing off. As always, thank you for downloading. Thank you for listening. And let's go birds.